So we were looking at series. So infinite sums that might converge or might diverge. And I um we've got sort of a few questions to cover. We're not going to cover all of these today, but if I sort of summarized my questions, it would be when does a series unover? And this is a difficult question. If I'm remembering my section numbers correctly, we'll spend 10.3 to 10.6 or so trying to address that question. And The second question I think it's natural to ask is, if a series converges, what does it converge to? And except in some kind of specialized cases, this question is too hard for us to try to answer. So it's a natural question, but it's not a question we can tackle. And the big question to my mind is whether this is good for anything. Like integral calculus, lots of applications. We unfortunately, with one thing and another, we lost two days or however much. We never ended up getting to talk about applications in depth, but you've seen the net change theorem. You use an integral if you want to know how much something is changing. So it's not a mystery when you would use integral calculus. It is, to my mind, kind of a mystery when you would want to add an infinite number of things together. Fortunately, it's a mystery we are going to address. We're going to look at applications of these infinite series starting in chapter 10.7 or so. There's some very interesting stuff in there. For now, we're still in chapter 10.2. Result um, and I believe that the last topic we discuss in chapter 10.2 are geometric series. So these are, we're going to look at a special kind of series in chapter 10.2. And we're going to look at another type, special type of series in chapter 10.3. And then we're going to use both of those special series in 10.4. So geometric series. Via sort of 
ancient and unspoken tradition. Geometric series usually seem to use R as their variable instead of X. And we're going to start at zero. And the significance of starting at zero is that R to the power of zero is one. So starting this series at zero makes the R vanish from the first term. And that there are other ways we could accomplish this, but this is the easiest. So the second term is going to have R to the first. The third term is going to have R to the second. The fourth term is going to have R cubed and so on. And this, is a series. And it's about the simplest series we can have. Um, in particular, you know how I said here that we're not going to ask questions about what convergent series converge to, because that's too hard for us. Geometric series are the exception. If a, um, if a geometric series converges, we can say what it converges to. That is, we can say what the infinite sum is. And we won't try to build up suspense. We'll just answer the natural questions very quickly, and then we'll discuss our answers. The first thing I said was a natural question is, when does a series converge? And um, it converges if the absolute value of R is less than one. And to clarify, because I think maybe I misspoke earlier, I think maybe I called R a variable earlier. R isn't a variable, R is a constant. All of the, and A is a constant as well. So like an example of a convergent theory or an example of a geometric theory is, is this, and this is two plus two times a third plus two times a third squared plus two times a third cubed onwards to infinity. So I've claimed that these series converge if the absolute value of R is less than one. So A is not affecting whether the series converges or not. If we look, if we look here, and that's maybe let's remind ourselves if we. Um, the absolute value of R being less than one, if we haven't seen 
absolute value is in a while. That's the same as saying that R is between negative one and positive one. So, this series converges. One third is indeed between negative one and positive one. Why is that? Can we approve of this? Well, the argument here, I've always thought it was kind of cute. Um, so let's first of all remind ourselves um, that we answer questions of convergence or divergence in terms of, I don't want, I don't want to use N in two different ways here. Let's say N is going from zero to M. And this then is the nth partial sum. And we answered questions about convergence or we define convergence in terms of these partial sums. That if we just take the limit as M goes to infinity of these partial sums, we should look at the limit, and if it converges, the series converges, and if it diverges, the series diverges. So the limit as M goes to infinity of these finite sums, is how we define the infinite sum. And ordinarily, this definition isn't going to be helpful to us, speaking frankly. Like, you know, back in integral calculus, when we defined an integral as a limit of Riemann sums, and then we never found a single integral using that definition. We just used the fundamental theorem. It's kind of like that. So this is our definition, but we're not usually going to be able to use it to actually answer questions. Uh, geometric series are the exception. If we perform the correct trick, we can analyze partial sums of geometric series. So S sub M is A plus R plus R squared plus R cubed. And we keep going until we get to the subscript. So we keep going until we reach this finite polynomial, and then we stop. And the trick here, and this is not something I would like just to give to you and tell you to figure it out. But the trick is we're also going to compute A times S sub M. 
No, we're not. We're going to come shoot. R times S sub M. And where our next step is going to be a subtraction step. Heaven's sake. I was so concerned that I was going to run out of space here. I just didn't write in the A's except for that last one. Sorry for that sloppiness. A plus AR plus AR squared plus AR cubed up to ARM. Give everyone a second to scribble those A's into your notes if you they weren't there. So R times S sub M is actually very similar to S sub M. Here's why the trick works. Because R times A is A R. And if we take this term and we multiply it by R, we get AR squared. And if we take this term and we multiply it by R, we get AR cubed. If we take this term and multiply it by R, we get AR to the M plus one. So S sub M and R S sub M are very similar. R S sub M is missing this A, and it's got this term that wasn't in S sub M. Otherwise, these polynomials are identical. All good so far? And then the trick. We're going to subtract these. S sub M minus R times S sub M. And I sort of broke my uh, alignment, but we've got A minus zero, which is A. Then we've got AR minus AR, so that turns to zero. And AR squared minus AR squared, that cancels. And everything cancels, except that we're also going to have a zero minus A times R to the M plus one. And um, our trick continuing, we're going to pull out a one minus R. Here we can pull out an A. And copy this down. We're going to have to move to another uh, frame. But the next thing we are going to do is we're going to divide both sides by one minus R.
And now ordinarily taking the limits of partial sum is, is not a helpful way to go because ordinarily there's no way of finding a limit of partial sums. But the limit as M goes to infinity of A over one minus R times one minus R to the M plus one, we can find. And this limit either exists or doesn't exist depending on R, depending on the absolute value of R. So when we take this limit, what happens? Well, we're changing M. So M is going to infinity. So that first term, it doesn't have any M's in it. It just has an A and an R. So that first term, we don't have to worry about. What about this? Well, let me give two sort of example, as I guess you could say. Let's take the limit as, I don't know if that hot pink, it's great for circling things, maybe for text, we'd like something a little more restrained. <clears throat> What if we have something like this? One minus two to the power of M. Well, as M is going to infinity, this limit is going to negative infinity. It doesn't exist. And that's because two to the M is an exponential function. Its base is greater than one, so it's growing. And I mean, in particular, as M is going to infinity, two to the M is going to infinity. And this limit does not exist. And there's nothing special about who here. If I had one minus three to the M, well, three to the M is also going to infinity and this limit doesn't exist. If I had one minus seven fourths to the M, well, seven fourths to the M is going to infinity, and this limit doesn't exist. And again, to make sure we're all on the same. Hey, zooming. There we go. So the point here is that an exponential function goes to infinity as long as this base is greater than one. So two to the M, if we zoom out a bit, 
we see this exponential function going very quickly up to infinity. Two point two point four to the m going to infinity. One point four to the m going to infinity. One point zero 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 a whole bunch of m of uh, point zeros. Well, it's taking its time, but it's possible Desmos is going to make a fool of me by just rounding this to zero. I think maybe that's what's happening here. Yeah, Desmos just rounded that to one. But there we go. Few enough zeros that Desmos can work with it, even though this is only a little bit above one. This is going to infinity. So any time this space is greater than one, this exponential goes to infinity, and we'll have one minus infinity, just like we do here. If the base is less than one, say, hey, the smoke is always kind of weird when I erase stuff. Say four fifths. If the base is less than one, this exponential function is going to zero. So four fifths point nine eight, whatever the base is. If it's less than one, I should say if it's between zero and one, this exponential is going to zero. So if instead of seven fourths, I had one fourth, now this exponential expression is going to zero. And suddenly, this limit exists. The limit as m goes to infinity of one minus one fourth to the m is one minus zero, which is one. We haven't looked at the case where m is negative, where um. R, R, where this fraction here, we haven't looked at the case where it's negative because Desmos will flip out on us if we try to um, make it graph an exponential function with a negative base. But the same thing happens. If this um, fraction is between zero and negative one, we get one minus zero and this limit is one. If this fraction is less than negative one, we get one minus infinity again. So this is either one if the absolute value of R is less than one, or it's infinity. If the absolute value of R is greater than one. So this limit can exist or this limit cannot exist. 
If the absolute value of R is less than one, then we've got this fraction times one. And the limit as M goes to infinity of S sub M equals A over one minus R. And that's again, as long as the absolute value of R is less than one. Or the absolute value of R could be bigger than one, and a fraction times infinity is infinity. And the limit as M goes to infinity of S sub M could not exist. DNE does not exist. And uh, we're missing two numbers here, but having made this argument, I'm just going to say that if the absolute value of R is exactly equal to one, this, uh, this limit does not exist as well. It, it's a little more intricate. And then this tells us, remember that, I mean, by definition, a series converges if the limit of partial sums converges. So the geometric series converges if we're in the first case. If the absolute value of R is less than one. And that is just what I said here. So I wasn't lying. These geometric series converge if the absolute value of R is less than one. And also, and this is pretty special, this is the only face in the next uh, five or so sections that we're going to say what a series converges to. But if a geometric series converges, it converges to A divided by one minus R. And as a quick example here, this thing converges. <laughs> We've made that observation. A is two, R is one third. So it converges to two over one minus one third, two over two thirds uh, which if my mental arithmetic that's uh, we can multiply both sides by the reciprocal of the denominator that's six over two and that is indeed three yeah so this geometric series converges and a very unusual situation, we can say what it converges to. So, uh, 
So that's the idea behind geometric series. Does anybody have any questions so far? There's a shoot, uh, there's a shoot application to geometric series. For, uh, for the most part, we're going to have to um, wait until like section 10.7, maybe more like 10.8 before we start 10.10, .10, before we start looking at applications of these series. But, um, Geometric series have, as I say, this kind of shoot application where you can use them to rewrite repeating decimals as fractions. This is something that I guess we must learn to do back when we're children. I forget how the material is presented. But let's look at this as a question of series. Say that we have 0 0.17 repeated. The key to this um, problem is that every infinite decimal can be thought of as a series. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll start a little simpler, and then we can work our way up. Let's just have one repeating infinitely. Now, every decimal, as I said, can be thought of as a series in the following way. We've got a one in the tenth place. So that's a tenth. And we've got a one in the hundredth place. So that's a hundred. And we've got a one in the thousandth place. And that's a thousandth. And then we've got a one in the next place, ten thousandths. So each of these decimal places gives us a fraction. And if we add up this infinite number of fractions, we get the decimal. And there's nothing special about repeating decimals here. We can always do this. Like if we have I, this isn't a repeating decimal, but we can still rewrite it as an infinite sum. We've got a one in the tenth place and a four the hundredth place and a one in the thousandth place and so on. So every decimal can be rewritten as an infinite sum. What makes repeating decimals special is that the sum we get from a repeating decimal is geometric. 
So we can actually figure out what this sum is. And we're in a kind of different situation than we were in the last example. We don't have sigma notation on the bool is the first thing. So we have to maybe take a second to think what's A and what's R, since we don't have them theory written like we did in this example, where we could just read them off. Well, A is always just the first term in the series. So A is one tenth. What about R? And also, by the way, I've said this is geometric. I don't know if that's obvious to everyone. So let's add that question into the mix. Is this really a geometric? series. Well, when we have a geometric series, we go from one term to the next by multiplying by the same constant. So we go from here to here by multiplying by a third. We go from here to there multiplying by a third. We go from here to here, multiplying by a third. That's what makes a series geometric. Let me write the next term. So to go from one tenth to one one hundredth, we multiply by a tenth. To go from one one hundredth to one one thousandth, we multiply by a tenth. To go from this one one thousandth to one ten thousandth, we multiply by a tenth. So this really is geometric to go from one term to another, we always multiply by the same number. We always multiply by a tenth. And that number we multiply by is our R. So A is a tenth, R is also a tenth. And this infinite sum is A divided by one minus R. Uh, screwed up somewhere. This one minus R would be nine tenths. Oh no, I didn't screw up. I, the tens cancel. And we find that point one repeating is one and nine. And let's see if. Our calculator wants to load with 
any kind of speed, we can check our work. So this is supposed to be point one repeating, and indeed it is. So you can look for almost out of time, but if you have like point seventeen, seventeen, seventeen. 17. The only difference would be um, that we have to look at these in units of two now. Point seven, point one seven is 17 over a hundred. And then this. Point seventeen here. Well, now where one, two, three, four, seventeen over um, ten thousand, and this. See, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventeen over a million. So if you've got a pattern, you've got to uh, think of the geometric series a little different. The, the denominator here, it's 17 repeating over and over. So that 17 is giving us these denominators. And then we think, well, this is 17 over 100. If we just look at this, this one is in the thousandth face, this seven is in the 10,000th face, this is 17 over 10,000. At this third, this one is in the 100,000th face, this seventh is in the millionth face, it's 17 over a million. And here, we're actually, somehow not going to have time to finish this, but A is just the first term always. So A is 17 over 100. R, to go from 17 over 100 to 17 over 10,000, we multiply by one one hundredth. And actually we can finish this, uh, just bear with me. If we go 30 seconds over, that's A divided by one minus R. 1 minus 1, 100 is 99, 100. 17 over 99. Let's see if we. Yep, that is indeed point one seven repeating. So we're mostly done with this section. I think there's one like, five minute topic left to go. We'll do that tomorrow. That's fine.
Um, starting with this and continuing for a while, like until the end of chapter 10, your homework is now textbook homework assignments. I warned you that that was coming. Um, again, it's really, I mean, it's easier for me if you scan and upload them, but I guess at a pinch, since you do, you know, sit in this room, you could just do them pen and paper and hand them straight to me and not uh, worry about the upload. Either way, uh, although the, the due dates are still sudden. So, of course, you can't hand me uh, an assignment Sunday evening. In any event, I will see you all Tuesday.